I'd like to introduce our very special guest today, the legendary Richard Lawrence. Richard is the founder and executive chairman of Overlook Investments Group, which uh, he established in 91 and is serving as one of the largest and most successful investors in Asia. As impressive as Richard's business and investment uh, achievements are, Richard is equally remarkable with his philanthropy being one of the largest and most entrepreneurial environmental and philanthropists in the world. He's the co-founder of several nonprofit organizations with specific focus on climate change mitigation. Uh, he and his wife, Dee, founded uh, Proyecto Mirador Foundation, which builds uh, fuel efficient stoves in rural communities in South America. He's also founded Cool Effect, which is a platform that enables individuals and companies to offset their carbon emissions through carbon reduction projects worldwide. And in addition, he's founded Carbon Mapper, which develops satellite technology to pinpoint and track point source emissions. And he has worked to secure over $300 million in philanthropic funds for methane advocacy and mitigation. Richard lives in San Francisco with his wife and two adult children. And he recently published this really enjoyable book right here called The Model, 37 Years Investing in Asian Equities. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to welcome the one and only Mr. Richard Lawrence. Richard, thank you so much for joining us. Mo, thank you. And thank you to your sponsors for, for putting this on and to all your members of your community. Uh, it's just a, a thrill and an honor to be here and spend some time and exchange some views uh, about the world together. So, and, and views on investing. So I'm delighted. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's great. Just before we get to the views on the world and views on investing, I always I, I I always ask all of our legends to start with their own story, and maybe you could share a little bit about where you grew up, what were some of your more formative experiences, and and perhaps how you got to be sitting here. Uh, uh, well, I grew up outside New York. Uh, my dad was a money manager, running a sort of a multifamily office in New York that he deeply loved, he really loved research. Um, for a period of time, uh, it, this was in the late 60s, uh, if I memorized a poem, my dad would give me a share of his mutual fund. <laughs> but in those days, mutual funds never went anywhere and I got really bored with poems, so I, I scrapped that. But I did get into uh, early at an early age into stocks and stock prices. Um, so I, I went to the normal kind of schools you go to, I think they probably one of the really informative moments of my life was I was sitting around a few weeks before graduation and I was involved with a girlfriend at the time and, and uh, I was sitting around with my roommates and they all said that they had jobs. And I was like, hey, when were you gonna tell me that I need a job? I got no job, you know? And so I went to my economics professor who had, I'd studied under him really doing international economics and development economics. And I went to him and said, I got no job, professor. And he says, Richard, go to Venezuela. Hmm. And I kind of looked at him and got, go to Ven Venezuela. You know, I was trying to think, where is Venezuela? So I said, yeah, okay, that sounds like a plan. I got no other plan. So I went back and I called up my dad. I said, dad, I, I, I figured out what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Venezuela. And, and I'm sure my dad also like, Huh? <laughs> but I went to Venezuela. I got myself a job. I was paid $225 a month, <laughs> learned the language, lived in South America for three years, and it taught me how big the world was. And uh, I went back and I was a research analyst in New York uh, for three years with a, one of the great people, one of the great mentors, you know, and we all need a bit of luck in life. And, and one of the biggest pieces of luck you can get is to have a mentor. Um, so my mentor was a guy named my John Bush, who was the younger brother of President Bush one. Hmm. And John was one of the great people of the world. Um, coincidentally, he, he passed away last year on the exact same day as David Swenson, who was, of course, the famed uh, CIO of Yale. And the two of them shared the obituary page. And I was probably the only person on earth that had such deep relationships with both of them. Um, hmm. uh, so it's really a shocking day in that. But, but my time in Venezuela told me I didn't want to live in America. <laughs> and and uh, so after three years, uh, I picked up and I wanted to travel. So I, I traveled for a year with my girlfriend, who's now my wife. And we set up shop in Hong Kong. I had no money. I had a backpack. Um, I was completely broke. 
my first job didn't pay me very much, but I, I got going and I realized uh, completely unknowing to me that Hong Kong was a place that I'd been searching for my entire life, hmm. that it was an entrepreneur's hangout. Everything was yes. And uh, I just fell into it and, 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 and had a connection to the entrepreneurs, the Chinese entrepreneurs, particularly the Southern Chinese entrepreneurs, the Hong Kong Chinese entrepreneurs. And, you know, I've been working, working there ever since. It's been 37, 38 years. Um, and, and just before we go to, to China and Overlook and what you've been doing for the last 38 years, just come back to John Bush for a second. You know, what is it that he taught you most? Like, what is it that you felt that uh, was truly transformative about his mentorship to you? Oh, there, there were, it's a pretty long list, you know, little tricks of the trade. I've written in the book about the Colombo question, which is one of the great questions um, designed around Peter Falk, who had a TV series called Colombo, where he sure. kind of plays stupid when asking a question. John was the master of that. And I've used that question all the time throughout my life with, with companies. But, but John walked into the office and rather like my dad, like, rather like a lot of people of his generation, and they didn't care about themselves. All they cared about was the clients. Hmm. There was just no entering in any, there was no space for him and his interests. It was all about the clients. Uh, John was also a great stock picker, had things keeping things kind of simple, which I think good investors need to do. He wanted really high, high profitable uh, businesses that were growing modestly and self-financing their growth. So there was a lot of the core of Overlook was in John. So, so you mentioned Overlook, um, you know, and how did you go from going to Hong Kong, penniless with a backpack, starting working as an analyst? How'd you get and 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 so you how did you get to the formation of Overlook to building it, and what were some of the biggest learnings and surprises along the way? Well, I I spent about four and a half years working for a subsidiary, uh, a listed subsidiary of First Pacific, which was a an Indonesian owned conglomerate in Asia. Not my type of company or not my type of business, and I think actual fact the share price is really close to where it was 40 years ago. Hmm. Um, but, but I was, you know, in Asia, visiting companies, learning, making mistakes, um, you know, seeing how little fundamental economic research was being done on stocks. And uh, we, you know, I was going into companies, I was the first foreigner ever to walk in and see them, certainly the first redhead, you know, and, and sometimes that helps you and sometimes it hurts you, you know. Um, but it, it gave me enough um, experiences with companies that then when we sold the listed entity and I had a little bit of money and I, my wife and I wanted to stay in Hong Kong, I had just enough self-confidence. I was in my, I guess I must have been about 36, 37. I had just enough confidence to uh, set up a vehicle. And there hadn't been, I mean, I was arguably the second individually owned fund management business in Hong Kong. So there were not a lot of us. There were not a lot of lawyers and, and custodians and administrators. All that stuff was not set up. Um, but I had just enough confidence. I got a lot of help from my great, great friend, uh, Dr. Mark Farber of Bloom, Doom and Boom Report. Uh, I moved into Mark's office and Mark gave me a few introductions. Um, and then, you know, I just kind of parceled together $30 million. Um, and likewise, when I was going back and talking to American, mostly individual investors at that point, they had no investments in Asia, right? International investing hadn't really even begun, Mo. And so it was so early days that I, I snapped together $30 million. I grew it over the next few years to about 60. Hmm. And then I did a rights issue to raise some more money along the way. And so over, let me think here, the first four years, I got to about 120 million. And then 97, 98 hit and I turned it into 45. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Raw talent, raw talent. Yeah. 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 Well, so, but, you know, listen, 
of course, and we'll get to some of the crises perhaps, but you know, that 45 subsequently became 7 billion and you know, you've done some incredible things. When, as you were uh, growing the business, you know, post uh, obviously 97, 98 crisis, uh, and you probably looked out into the world of asset management, which asset managers did you look at with admiration? And also when you looked at asset managers that were doing it wrong, what practices did you see other asset managers employing that you said, you know what, no, when I go out and build my business, I'm going to do this differently? Well, starting in New York, I started reading investment books. And by the time I started Overlook, I really had a very disciplined process that uh, every other book I read was an investment book, almost by, by law. You know, Richard's Law, you know, I make it legal. Um, and so in those books, I was finding pieces that were helping me. And I was, you know, I think back, I spent a year in Mark Farber's office before I raised the $30 million, Mo, and I really put it together. And it was at that moment that I, those, those months where I said, when the lights are out at night, how are you really going to invest? How are you really going to run this thing? And that was when I said, oh, you know, I need to go read Winning the Loser's War by Charlie Ellis. Oh, I need to reread, you know, some of Peter Lynch's stuff. I need to reread Buffett's old letters when he was smaller, you know. And so I was piecing all these, all these things together to make it something that was, that fit me, right. you know, to use the old O.J. Simpson thing, you know, the glove fit, right? You don't want to you don't want to force an investment philosophy or you don't want to force business philosophies. You want to make them really instinctive and natural to you and, and authentic to you. And so I got it partly out of books, partly out of people uh, like John Bush and my dad in New York, who I thought were just these uh, titans of ethical fund management. And I was also getting it from really dicey business practices that I was seeing all over Asia. Right. You know, there were there were very few rules and regulations in those days. And you had to, you know, it was the Wild West. You know, you, uh, you, you had to rely on yourself because no one else was looking after you. And I think it was, it's sort of some offense, some defense. You you bring these things together. And, 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 and I think a lot of that is reflected in the the investment work that we do and it's also reflected in the business practices that we've adopted so could you maybe elaborate that because i i i don't want to lose something which is easily lost in this conversation is you've had 30 plus years of just extraordinary outperformance so you know north uh, around 14 percent per annum what have you and in order to sustain that kind of outperformance for that long, you've had to do things differently than others. So what do you believe are some of the notable differences that have been critical to your long-term success? I, I think I think we've brought a, a real passion to stock picking. A lot of people, you know, you interview people and you ask them, what books have you read? And they say, well, uh, Buffett, you know, like, well, no, you got to go a little further than that, you know, to have any credibility, right? Because that shows no passion. And, and passion is this detective story. It's, it's unwinding this detective story, which is a public company. And are, do they, does the public company give you the protections and the profitability and the growth, all those things that you require? Um, so I, I think passion for the task is part of it. Now, when it's just me making all the, the, the trips to see the companies, it's very easy. As you build out your organization, you have to institutionalize passion. And the way you do that is to find people that really buy in, to buy in into the, into the investment philosophy and all the components of the investment philosophy. And when you do that, you're going to find you make some mistakes. And it used to be that I tried to change people in the early days. Um, we don't do that now. It's a bad fit. It's a bad fit. And we ask you to leave. Um, because when you hire people, it's, you don't always get it right. I mean, it's, it's a little different. But so I think just raw passion, discipline comes next, mm -hmm. um, being really disciplined. And my partner, James Squire, who's been with me for 15 years, is, is the most disciplined investor. I, I always thought I was pretty good, but 
well, I'm a rookie next to him, you know, but I, but I think that discipline is a, an essential, an essential component of investing. Then on the business practices, it's really just, it's, it's outlawing greed. It's not being greedy. If you're not greedy, if you don't care about money, it's easy to outlaw greed. And when you outlaw greed, that's the one thing that most people in the investment management business cannot do. They just can't do it. For years, other fund managers, wannabe fund managers would come and see me and say, Richard, how'd you do it? I said, well, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I'll, I'll, I'll make some introductions to help you out, but I, I need one thing in your legal documents, which is put in a legal cap on subscription. Not at a billion dollars. I'm talking, you know, 50, 80 million dollars, really limited so that you showing your investors, you know what you're doing. And I said, put it in the legal documents and come back and see me and I'll make some introductions for you. Hmm. No one in 37 years has ever come back. And so the, the impact of greed, it, it kind of is like a bad disease. It kind of gets into a lot of things. You end up having too many stocks in the portfolio. You're appeasing too many employees. Uh, you're, you're getting too many funds. You know, you're accumulating too many assets, you know, so, so I think those are where you got to start, you know, and, and if, if you have the passion to outlaw the greed is easy because my passion wasn't ever to make a gazillion dollars. I, I really don't care about money, but, but the passion so then allowed me to just outlaw the greed, which is what clients we're looking for and are looking for and will continue to look for. So again, I just want to double click on something. So when you, you didn't care about money, what did you care about? And when you talk about passion, what was the passion about? And and when you're looking for people, what passion are you looking for them? Because, you know, I could share this sentiment with you, you know, money doesn't really do much for me, but most of the people you hire, you know, on some level, it does a lot of things for them. Um, and so how do you, how do you, outlaw greed how do you how does that all come together I, I, I my wife would tell you that i compete with her on brushing our teeth <laughs> uh, i mean as absurd as it is you know i'm intensely competitive and i loved the fact that here i was a white guy with red hair investing in asia where i knew no university graduate i knew no political figure i knew no ceo i knew nobody I had no advantages and yeah, okay, let's bring it on, you know? And it's just, I just love competing, you know? I, 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 that, and, and so that was- You're finding people that love the game. That's, that's what you're- and, and so to go to your second point, Mo, uh, as I look for people, I've always looked for people who played team sports. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I think there are two aspects of team sports. It's the collect. It's the ability to be a collective unit, a cohort. We all got each other's backs, right? We're all in this fight together, right? Which is really what we preach at Overlook, which is the enemy is not internal. The enemy is external, right? Um, but then also they've gone through the success and failures collectively with a group of people because yeah. no sports figure has ever gone their whole career without losing, right? We've, we've all had those ups and downs. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I, I, a couple of other things, you know, in, in your book, one of the things you talked about is this difference between uh, time-weighted and capital-weighted returns, which distinguishes you from other asset managers. Just for the uninitiated, could you just explain what you mean by that? Why is it so important and how you've incorporated it into your strategy? Yeah, so, so when you open up Barron's and you see uh, an advertisement from T. Rowe Price or Vanguard or something, they'll tell you that XYZ fund grew at X percent from a starting point to an ending point. The, the NAV per share of that fund grew, okay? And that's how the fund did. Okay, fair enough. But there's a second point, which is how did the investors in that fund do? Because they all didn't invest day one and they all didn't exit day Z or day 100 or day 1000, whatever it is. They came in and went out at various times. And what you typically see in the money management business is that investors do extremely well with small amounts of money. Then they become popular 
the assets grow very aggressively. And with that larger amount of money, they do very poorly. And so Charlie Munger used to talk about the return on dollar of assets under management, right? Which is effectively how, how have investors done cumulatively uh, on the basis of the capital? How have they done individually with their account? And how have they done collectively? And they're very different numbers. A good friend of mine, Ilya Dikhev, who was at a, a professor at, at the graduate school at Emory, did a study about 13, 14 years ago now, which really opened my eyes to this. Um, but maybe before I get to Ilya, I'll say right at the beginning, I had, a, I had a Swiss client and he said, Richard, I want my capital way to return every month. Hmm. So I go, hey, no problem. You know, I went to my uh, part-time account and I said, we got to give him the capital way to returns every month and we might as well give it to everybody. And, but my view at the time was, Mo, look, if I do well, if I'm honest, if I'm trustworthy, if I do what I say I'm going to do, the money will stay. And if I don't, the money will go regardless of what the okay. time or capital way to returns are. And, and, and then about 14 or 15 years later, I read Ilya's research and it showed that he had studied the top 100 hedge funds who had lasted 10 years or longer. So the successful guys. And he said that there was a discount between the time weighted return, which is what they said their fund grew at, and the capital weighted return, which is how the underlying investors did. And that discount was seven and a half percentage points per year. Wow. wow. So if wow. the fund says they're doing 10, they're actually ending up delivering two and a half. And it was like, and at this point at Overlook, we had done the same because we operated in a certain manner. And, and that was what opened my eyes to A, the importance of capital weighted returns for a whole host of reasons we can get into if you're interested in. But, but my lack of greed, my lack of interest in growing super aggressively a, an asset management firm all helped contribute to these, to these capital weighted returns. And, and if you, and I'll shut up here, Mo, and if you really believe in capital weighted returns, like you believe on caps on subscription, right? Then you run it, then you run your firm in a very distinctive way. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and frankly, you know, you were one of the first guests that we had and look, we've had lots of impressive guests, but that one or two people emailed me saying, I've known Richard for years. He's one of the most honest guys you'll ever meet. So anyway, that there's uh, that goodwill obviously uh, follows you through life. So I want to turn the conversation to you know your unique area of expertise, which is particularly the Asian markets and where you think the Asian markets are today. You know, from an outsider's perspective looking in, there's some very um, visible tailwinds. Um, you know, in high GDP growth, continued rise in middle class, growing service economy, etc. And at the same time, significant headwinds with you know, China's threats over Taiwan, their the net zero policy, their COVID zero policy, North Korea, et cetera, et cetera. How are you thinking about the macro picture for Asia in the context of today's geopolitical arena? Well, Asian stocks have been going down now. Um, for, we're entering our 17th month. They peaked in February, 2021. We've had a bit of rally in the last week, but they've touched down 36%. In my book, I document bear markets going back to the 1920s, and the average bear market has been 36% down over 16 months. So, so we, we rallied off, but we'll probably test the lows here. Um, so we're down kind of an average bear market. The US market, the North American markets have peaked much later. And so there's not this perception that, that uh, we're really been in our bear market for quite a long time. Now, it, it may be a big bear market uh, because of global inflation, but we can come back to that. Um, uh, China is, has become the big kahuna in Asia, you know, and, and uh, so this really dominates the region. Everyone else kind of plays off of, off of China, either with lower wage rates or higher specialty service skills or other things. But you really got to focus uh, on China. Um, there are a few things to remember about Asia. One is the place is incredibly entrepreneurial. 
the Chinese entrepreneur is instinctive, long-term, uh, sometimes way too aggressive, sometimes not aggressive enough, but it's, it's almost, um, it's an inherent skill. It gets almost from birth. They're, they're really, really exceptional. And they are driving, say, for example, 80% of urban employment today. Hmm. The other thing to remember is that um, China is integrated and is the largest trading partner with many, many countries around the world. And so it's, uh, the U.S. will tell you that they want to decouple, they want to put sanctions on China, they want to completely suppress uh, the Chinese economy, but, but the, 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 the horses have already left the barn in, in a lot of ways, and, and the American people deserve great support for bringing 700 million people up out of poverty over the last 30, 40 years. Um, but it's, those are things that really aren't, aren't going to change very much. Um, we, we have a couple of routes that we could follow. You could just continue the managed decoupling where people are getting things back in balance. I noticed today, Apple said they're going to manufacture more in Vietnam. It's just a rebalancing and all that is healthy. Frankly, they'll probably rebalance with the same people who are running the factories up in China, but you know, so it's, mm. but it's, it's a rebalance of sort and we need, we need to do that. You could contrast that, Mo, with um, particularly if China was seen to be delivering large amounts of arms to Russia or a blockade or an attack on Taiwan, that you'd get sanctioned decoupling, which would really lead to regionalization of the three or four parts of the world um, at, at great cost to, frankly, every consumer around the world. Uh, higher inflation, lower prosperity. So I think we need our political leaders to take a bit of fresh air and a deep breath and say, how do we uh, ensure that we continue to do the managed decoupling, which, which says that, look, if you're Walmart or Kmart, keep buying what you can from China because it's cheaper. But if you're Intel, be very careful of your technology. And, and, and China has those same tit for tats that we have. Um, so I, I think we're, largely there, but you know, we are in a world run by politicians who are completely focused on nationalism. And then the, the other thing I'd say is that when Xi Jinping gets up out of bed every morning, he's got the problems that you mentioned, um, COVID, Russia relationship. Uh, he's got falling stock market, falling property prices, which is the money mm -hmm. for the Chinese people that can't be happy about that. Um, He's got lowering productivity of every dollar of debt. Every incremental debt produces less GDP. Uh, he's got an aging population. He, he's got a long list of, of big issues. And does he really want to add international sanctions like what Russia has? Right. Uh, I think probably not. So, um, so it's a tricky time. But again, if you're just looking for 20 to 25 names in a portfolio, there's lots of ways that Overlook can move. So I want to get to the portfolio in a minute. Just may as well just wrap up the geopolitical topic while we're on it. Just, you know, China and, and China, is, as you mentioned, one of the largest trading partners with many countries around the world, as is Ukraine, as is, I'm sorry, as is the U.S. And, you know, they, they've been fighting, you know, arguably proxy battles all over the world. Uh, some, some will even say that the war in, uh, between Russia and Ukraine is one that sort of is one of those proxy battles. Um, so, just your views on: Do you do you believe this virtual Cold War, so to speak, could erupt into a full confrontation in the years ahead? How much of it, like, given you said, look, you can't predict politicians. How much is political? How much is real? And might and what might change the relationship for the better, if uh, if anything at all? Yeah, I I think that particularly vis-a-vis -vis China, there's a, there's a spectrum, like a pendulum. And for many, many years, we were out here where we had what we call technocratic China. That, and a lot of those decisions were pretty easy to deregulate and modernize the economy, start the export machine, et cetera, et cetera. But in the last six, seven years, we've swung around. And I think about, oh, probably six, nine, six months ago, we probably hit the apex of what I call political China, uh, where Xi Jinping was outlawing um, 
uh, wanted to outlaw makeup for women because he felt that it made women feel insecure. I mean, it got, it got kind of crazy, right? He was outlawing all these things. Uh, it, it got way overdone. I think now we've seen, particularly with the economic problems that we talked about of falling real estate, falling equity prices, we're gonna have higher unemployment, uh, lower productivity, plus the aging, it, that, that we've seen over the last six months that this is beginning to pull back and the technocratic China is beginning. We're not back in equilibrium, but we're beginning, I think, have probably seen the worst. Uh, I think that all these issues have weakened the Communist Party and therefore weakened Xi Jinping. And um, I think as we pull back into technocratic China, we have much more behind the scene debate over what really is the best long-term things. And, and, and if we can continue to have that, even modestly, then you can begin to have what I call what's required is private and confidential discussions sponsored at the highest level by Biden, the, the EU and by Xi on recreating a roadmap for the West's relationship with China over the next several decades. And it's well overdue. Mm -hmm. And that has to be done privately and confidentially. And they have to start with what I call the quick and easy where they can just, it's easy decisions. Let's do this, this, and this. Then we can move on to the tough, difficult, complicated issues. And then we can leave the third bucket, which is the impossible ones, leave them, leave them alone. You know, and, and we suffered in the United States with Donald Trump, that Donald Trump went right to, I wanna, I wanna bring down the communist party. Well, that, that's not gonna happen. Right. <laughs> Let, don't waste your time, you know? So I think there's a method to negotiate with the Chinese and the Chinese will be very happy to negotiate. Um, but the way to do it is privately and confidentially, make some progress before you start bringing in every press and all the, the attitudes. Like yeah, many yeah, and that makes sense. So, so let's, let's kind of go a little deeper into the, into the portfolio. You know, when you look, just so that people have a little bit of context here, when people look at your portfolio overlook, like what's the geographical distribution of your holdings? I mean, in other words, uh, clearly you have a sizable allocation in China, perhaps Vietnam, perhaps Singapore, Philippines, I don't know. So it would be helpful to understand that distribution, but also to understand how and why you choose the countries that you're in, why you exclude Japan. I mean, Asia is, I, I believe the largest continent. Um, it would be interesting to hear how, how you think about the portfolio from that macro Asian view? Well, um, we've had a wide variety of allocations. Way back, I had the majority of the assets in Korea. I've had huge allocations to Thailand over the years. And, and about eight, seven, eight years ago now, we had made a mountain of money on consumer stocks that got up to 30, 35 times earnings. And we, we never made money going from 35 to 40. I just never done that before. So I didn't know, didn't have much confidence. And so we sold all those stocks. As we looked around, uh, we found A shares. And there was a lot happening seven, eight years ago. China was really getting the size they had also consolidated over 40 years, they had consolidated down big industries from literally thousands of players to a handful of players. And, and we were going in after a seven year bear market in China and the A shares, while you know, the consolidation had gone on, these companies had gotten big, they were cheap, no one was in them. We were again, as I had found 20, 25 years, before I was walking in, I was the first foreigner to meet with a lot of these companies. I was certainly the first redhead they had ever seen, you know, and uh, so they were cheap. And so we uh, very silently, and we we didn't announce it. Um, we we put really uh, at that time we'd we'd always had exposure to China, but we put the bulk of the fund in China at that time uh, through Hong Kong shares, but mostly through A shares in China sometimes through some ADRs in New York. And that allocation of China has largely persisted. And um, one of the things we came up with at that time is, was a saying that when, when you're big in China, you're big in the world. Mm -hmm. 
And 38 years ago, that was not true. But literally we went from thousands of beer companies down to five and they were big beer companies, big noodle companies, big utilities, big airports, you know? And um, so Asian Chinese companies became really the big competitive aggressive company in Asia. They, they, they were scaring the bejesus out of domestic Thai businesses hmm. you know, who were in the beer business or the noodle business because of their size. And so today, you know, we have 65% in, in, in what we'd say greater China, which would include Taiwan. The boundaries have all been blurred. There's a lot, there's some international sales in that stuff. There are regional sales in it, they're pure domestic. But what we've found is there's China is so big that it gives us this wonderful diversification opportunity, second only to the United States. And so there is day-to-day -day correlation amongst all the shares, but over time there's less and less correlation. And so we can find, as we have, we found really companies that meet our criteria uh, in China. And, and that's the hard thing to find, of course. And so as just as foreign capital is flowing out of China currently and the, you know, the yuan is de depreciating, does that create opportunities, presumably, or challenges for you? And, um, and, and where do you see some of the greater risks and opportunities? Because you seem to be fairly optimistic about the future of, of the Chinese economy. Where, where do you see the, the real opportunities and the real risks uh, in Asia today? Well, I, I think the downside of, of sanction decoupling is so bad for everybody. It's kind of like one of those things, hey, hey can we have a little time out? Let's, <laughs> let's put the children in the corner, give them 10 minutes and you know, think about this thing a little bit. You know? So I think we, we can move forward. Now that's not to say they're not gonna come out of the corner in 10 minutes and put the fists up and fight, you know, in which case we all bear the, the brunt of that. Um, so uh, assuming that, I mean, our view has always been in bear markets. One of our truisms is that you have to buy early and often. You have to buy and the stock's going down and you buy and they'll go down lower and you'll buy and they go down lower. And, you know, you go through the average duration and, and average decline of a bear market and, and then they keep going lower. But, but in my experience and in James Squire's experience, who works for me, we've never been big buyers right at the bottom. So to say, I'm gonna pick the bottom. And in actual fact, we buy very little because we're, we're frankly a bit pissed off at that point. And then when the first leg up, which should be the easiest, we also don't buy a lot because you're thinking, nah, it's gonna go back down again, right? And so having the discipline of buying early and often. And in that process, you're going, hopefully, if you didn't lose your brain at the top and own the wrong stocks, you know, that you got a bit of defensive names in there at the top. If you do that, what you can do is you can play less defense and more offense. Mm. And that offense won't pay off until you get the turn. But once you get the turn, by really executing a bear market, it's given us four, five, six years of outperformance twice in our history in the two really big bear markets. And so I'm pretty sure uh, that that the the roadmap buy early and often play more offense as you get going hook your wagon to a few horses i'm pretty sure that works stay away from whatever the index is don't look at it don't pay any attention to it also understand that yesterday's winners are are, are tomorrow's losers and yesterday's losers are often tomorrow's winners we're often going from deflation to inflation or inflation to deflation, globalization, deglobalization. And so you get change of leadership. And if you can capture some of that, uh, that's all the better. But, but basically be buying clean, profitable businesses throughout the bear market. Keep moving forward. Don't look back. Don't dwell on mistakes. Don't point fingers at your, at your colleagues. Yeah, and, and Richard, let me ask you a question because a question came in around you know the fact that some of the smaller markets have been adversely affected. You mentioned inflation and and obviously uh, rising bond prices. Um, if you could comment on that, how, how are you thinking about sort of again? You mentioned most of the capital today is in 
China and around China, whether it's Vietnam, Hong Kong, et cetera. But I, I think that if you could talk to us about the small countries and the opportunities or challenges there, and also I'm curious, you exclude Japan. Why is that, you know, why, why do you, and, and, and frankly, other managers ex who are in Asia seem to exclude Japan, if you could provide a little color. Well, I, I, when, when I came to Asia in, in, in 1985, the hottest financial instrument in Asia was warrants on massively overvalued China, uh, Japanese stocks. And that seemed crazy when I could buy the monopoly TV station in Hong Kong at five and a half times earnings. Why am I paying for uh, getting buying a warrant on a stock at 45 times earnings? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just ignored it. But with with globalization um, and regionalization, we now see uh, companies have Chinese or Asian exposure are, are listed all over the world. Hmm. And in, in many ways, we understand those businesses better than the analysts in the country where it's, li where it's listed. So we're really, so, uh, uh, so I think that that'll be, and has been coming for a number of years. Um, we've always liked ADRs. We felt US investors speculate on ADRs going up and when they don't go up, they get out of them. And when they get out of them, they get cheap and we could, it offers us opportunities to buy them. So. We, we like that those sort of inefficiencies. Um, and smaller markets? Uh, and I, I think smaller markets, the first thing markets. you have to say is unlike 97, 98, the economic, the macroeconomic conditions today, particularly with regard to current account, uh, credit growth, government deficits, all are in pretty good shape, okay? We have bigger deficits because of COVID, but those should come down. And, and the, the, the economic indicators that we follow, which are the five evils plus one, there aren't a lot of flashing red lights. I read this morning, there are now 12 sovereign countries where they've been put on some sort of credit watch. Um, those are not in Asia. You know, the, you usually expect Indonesia to be flashing red. It's not right now. So I think Asia is in pretty good shape from a macroeconomic point of view. The biggest problem we have, Mo, is that we buy stocks with market caps bigger than the AUM of the fund. And today we're about six and a half billion dollars. Um, we've given back $2 billion over the last three and a half years. So we've tried to keep it down, um, but there are a handful of stocks in Indonesia that we can buy. We know those, sometimes we get opportunities, sometimes we don't. So right. that's also a, a limit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that, that makes sense. Well, one of the things that, and you were talking a little bit earlier about sort of the confluence of, of um, uh, thinking through business practices as well as so the, the investment work that you do. And, you know, when we, I guess in the West, look out into Asia, you know, oftentimes there's a lot of corporate governance in Asia seems to be a little bit behind where it is in the West. Uh, and you share some, some really interesting stories in your book where you found your apartment in Hong Kong ransacked and your experiences in Korea. Can you know, share a little bit about that? And, and where is Asia today on the corporate governance side could, you know, to, relative to where it's been and, and relative to the West? I think greed is a universal culture. And when you have people who are excessively greedy, you have bad corporate governance. Um, and that's why we have this policy. We like to actually look the CEO in the eye and meet them and get to know them to, to understand this. Um, you know, uh, I've been on the losing end of corporate governance probably more than anybody else, just because I've been in Asia longer investing than anybody else. You know, I made more mistakes than anybody else, you know, and I had just enough uh, winners. Um, um, I think very reasonable investors. You know, there are a lot of things you can look for in companies that help you avoid bad corporate governance. And a lot of this stuff is, you know, just bad accounting. Well, I can tell you, property developers have very opaque accounting. So we don't invest in property developers most of the time. You know, every once in a while, I mean, we had some money with a great company called Link Reit, which was a real estate investment company, very clear and transparent. But most of the time, Property developers are just, they're, they're, they, 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 their eyes are bigger than their stomach. If they do a million dollar deal, they think they can do a hundred million dollar deal and they don't have the debt, you know, they don't have the capital. So there, there are a lot of industries. And then there are a lot of guys who grow too fast. 
with fast growth, you know, the wheels come off the, 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 the car for all the obvious reasons. And it's, and it's not just financing, it's HR, it's your people, it's your development, it's your R&D. You know, so we look for companies in this sweet zone of growing uh, 11, 12% with high profitability so that they can really generate free cash flow. And if you can get that, then we believe that you get better corporate governance because the owner doesn't need to steal from you. He's making his dividends and he's realized that, you know, he's got four cars, you know, whatever marital thing he's got going and, and, you know, whether he needs a plane, he's got a plane and five houses, he got the five houses, you know, you can't, you can't consume massive wealth, you know, so, so he generally behaves better. So um, we've come a long way in Asia. Um, you can't, rely on rules and regulations to protect you. For the most part, I don't rely on any of that. I rely on our own smarts, our own analysis of, of, of balance sheets and income statements. I think the individual man on the street, he needs regulatory support, you know, so I'm supportive of, of corporate governance regulations. Um, yeah, I don't know. And, that. And how do you just, I mean, the other element is always the, the leadership, the people, you know, and when you're confronted with such radically different cultures from the one you are from, and maybe it's a less of an issue today after 38 years there on the ground, but how do you assess the people, the management, like what tools does Overlook use that might be instructive for assessing uh, the, the the people, the, the the caliber, the culture, et cetera? Well, I... I... I mean, I think there, there are a number of things you can do, which all of us can do, right? Look at the long-term track record. How did they behave in 07, 08? How did they behave in 97, 98? You know, if they behave badly before, they're going to behave badly now. How aggressive are they? You know, for a long time in Asia, these CEOs were largely my age. So I, like, where'd you get your capital start? You know, and here's how I got my capital start. You know, we sort of bond a little bit. You know, how do people talk to you? Are they interested in having that discussion? Or they say, yeah, I, I, I took money from my father-in-law. I never paid him back, you know? <laughs> you know, I mean, what, how they've grown and capitalized their business tells you a lot about individuals, I think. And also, how do they, how do they talk to you? So like I've said, you know, I'm this white guy from New York, right? But he's also a little odd looking to me too. So we're, you know, we're both trying to figure each other out. But try to explain to him that what he owns, which is shares, is the same thing I own. And actually, in fact, it's different from what the girlfriend or the broker and the investment banker or the COO own. You know, I'm the guy who doesn't have a conflict of interest with this guy. Hmm. And sometimes that message gets through moments, other times it doesn't. Yeah. You know, and, and, and if they get hung up because I got red hair, you know, hey, get hung up. Yeah. Uh, in the, in the book, like you, 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 you're kind enough to, to offer a lot of really instructive mistakes and learnings that emerge from it. Um, what, when you think about those like most colorful mistakes slash learnings and, and the most, uh, that had the greatest impact on your own investing and overlooks investing, um, or approach to investing, what, what comes to mind? Well, you know, I put in all the mistakes, partly, so that my wife would read the book because she always thought they were very funny. <laughs> you know, like how, how, you know, she said, how could you be so stupid? And then she'd go, no, no, I know why you're so stupid because you are stupid, you know? <laughs> so no, look, learn failings is where you learn. Failings is absolutely where you learn. And I have a policy at Overlook that we never do postmortems on failings. We never talk about them. We just sell them and move on. Everybody knows who made the mistake. But we don't need to point fingers at some analyst and say, hey, you know, uh, don't do that. I've seen people broken in this industry from postmortems. And a lot of people love it. I mean, Ray Dalio seems to thrive on that stuff. But, but I, I, I'm trying to incentivize a group of people to have each other's back, to strive to achieve a single goal mm. collectively. Mm -hmm. And we're incredibly diverse. So we're, we're half female, half male, half Asian, half Western, 
the Asians come from all over Asia, the Westerners come from all over. I mean, we're like a social experiment, right? <laughs> and, and, and we're all aware of that day to day, right? And, and we've all bought in that while diversity is complicated, it adds richness to the decision-making. But in doing that, we have to be respectful of each other's differences. And so one of the things I bring, no postmortems, let's, let's learn from individually, collectively, let's learn from mistakes. I look at my role now is really, what can I do to help these people avoid some of the mistakes I've made? Um, because you're always gonna make them. If you can't handle making a mistake, you're in the wrong business. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Um, I know we're, we're sort of running up against time and I, I wanna make sure we don't leave this conversation before we tackle a topic that I know is close to your heart, which is you know, climate change and, and ESG. Um, and you know, the, the Chinese uh, and in particular, but Asians more broadly have been accused of being less attentive to it relative to Canadians, Europeans, and other Westerners. I guess it would be interesting to hear your thoughts on how, how you describe their ESG orientation and more broadly, how you've gotten involved in some opportunities around the climate change field and things where, where you see opportunities on that front as well. Well, I, I am uh, hugely appreciative when ESG as a topic came on to the scene about four years ago. Um, we've been working on governance forever. We've been working on social things, social conditions in factories and with workers and within companies for 20, 25 years. But we've been working on the environmental thing for about 15 years. I was extremely fortunate to have gotten to know Jeremy Grantham, who's my partner building stoves in Central America. And Jeremy rolled back uh, climate change to me in, in a way that only Jeremy can do slowly over time without pushing it on me. Um, and, uh, and, and so we've been on our companies about this and literally we were talking to the wall. When ESG came on, um, it's now opened the door for us to really engage in a, in a very serious dialogue. So we do not send out questionnaires, 500 questions, tick this box, tick that box. That's totally the wrong approach. And Wall Street's getting quite rightly criticized for that now. We have a three-part policy about our environment. One is we want to know the data. We want to know the data with real credibility. You know, are they reporting under TCFD, CDP? Does their accounting make sense? So we need to have people at Overlook who understand carbon accounting. And because I've run a carbon accounting project, I know the pitfalls on carbon accounting are even bigger than in GAAP. So that's the first thing. The second thing is we want to see real awareness. I want that CEO to really be able to speak intelligently to me on everything about stranded assets, how it's gonna affect his customers, how it's gonna affect his supply chain. And I wanna see it discussed at a, at a serious level. And then lastly, we want uh, compensation tied to it. Uh, that's you know, just the incentive structure to make these changes. And this policy has opened up the door. So we write letters now to the chairman and CEO. They're private and confidential. We set forth our policy. We set forth what we think they've done. We've set forth, uh, a, we give them all a grade and 40, 40, 45% of our companies routinely get Fs. So I'm writing <laughs> CEOs and, and chairmen saying, you got an F, you know? And, and then, we give them, then we give them specific actions that we feel they should take. Yeah. And this has engendered an enormous amount of back and forth with our companies and we're helping them and they appreciate it. They appreciate, we didn't just bash them, you know, as for all our activism. Um, and I think that we're now in kind of like the third inning. Hmm. We were in the first, we're now in the third, we got more work to do. And I'm looking forward to this year's letters and entering into another round of dialogues with these people because we've now been writing some of these companies for years. Right. So they, they know it's coming. Wow, <laughs> wow. Well, let me ask you something. Uh, the, one of the things that I, I believe it was Larry Fink of BlackRock or somebody else uh, mentioned a while back that the next round of unicorns are not gonna come from tech, they're gonna come from the environmental uh, opportunities and um, and companies that are trying to solve this big issue. Um, the 
to what where do you see the opportunities in climate uh, change? Um, and you've you've spoken, you and I have spoken about carbon credits. Would be interested in hearing your thoughts there. Uh, but where in, uh, are there opportunities in climate change, and uh, where are the opportunities that you are taking advantage of or thinking about? Yeah, I I do very little um, venture capital investing into into climate change unless I I see something that really I find really compelling that can go at scale because unlike any problem we've faced before, this is the quintessential scale problem. Uh, you know, we we talk in California. California cannot solve California's climate change problem. It's a global problem. And so, you know, on that list of, of things that the West needs to, to engage with Xi Jinping clearly is climate change. Um, so I'm not great on, on that. Jeremy Grantham has committed a lot of his wealth into uh, climate venture capital, and, and I think it's going to do enormously well. I'm just more interested in being the entrepreneurial grantor, the funder who will fund the thing that doesn't, that can't get funded, that's really critical. Um, so I, I, I look at it more like that. Having said that, at Overlook, we own the largest renewable energy company in the world, hmm. uh, which is a company that's owned 10% by foreigners. It's a $60 billion company and almost no one owns this thing. So uh, all these brilliant investors who are so keen on allocating DSG, I just wonder what they're thinking. Uh, that they've missed the largest renewable energy company, which is a company called China Yangtze Power, which owns um, the, the lowest cost electricity generating facilities in China that are 100% renewable. And it's the most stable free cash flow generator that we've found in our entire history. Um, foreigners just don't own it because it's a state-owned enterprise. But if you look at their corporate track record, their corporate governance has been, been perfect. Hmm. But, but 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 uh, so anyway, there are a lot of ways to play it. it. It's almost by definition, Mo. It has to be one of the biggest asset classes because the problem is so big, and we're losing time. Right, right, right. Um, and I know we're speaking of time. We're we're almost out of it. So maybe if I could ask just one question, nothing to do with Asia, nothing to do with carbon uh, or the environment. It just when you think back about the the best piece of advice that you've ever received. Love to hear uh, your thoughts on that. And 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 conversely, the the advice that you find yourself giving others most frequently, um, uh, what might those two be? The best piece of advice you received and the best advice that you've sort of found yourself offering others. There is a Latin phrase, illegitimus, illegitimus non corborundum, which means don't let the bastards get you down. <laughs> and my high school headmaster in the middle of winter used to roll this thing out regularly. And there's a real, there's a real truth to it. You know, we, we all are going to go through ups and downs in our lives. We'll have illness, we'll have marital issues, we'll have challenges with family or friends and stuff. And you just can't, you just can't give up. You can't stop pushing forward. So I think that's, really built so deep into my DNA. Yeah. And I guess it'd be the same thing that I would tell my close friends and colleagues, you know, well, you know, success is not measured by money. Success is not measured by, success is measured by what, what you yourself can do to make the world a little bit of a better place. And it, it can be through philanthropic stuff, or it can be just making nice friends and contributing to your community. It, it, there, there are lots of ways to measure success, but you got to strive to achieve success. That if not, not striving to achieve success, that's the failing. Yeah, no, I, I, Richard, I think that's a great way to end it. And you've done so many remarkable things in your career, both uh, professionally, but even more recently on the, on the charitable environmental side of things. So kudos to you. And thank you for joining us uh, and sharing your incredible insights with us and being so generous with your time and your wisdom. Um, really. Well, no, thank you. Thank you, Mo. And I'm really, I just finished the book last night. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to reading Selling Snake Oil. It's, <laughs> it's a book that's right up my alley for sure. So thank you. And thank you to your, to your cohorts and your community. I've, yeah. I've loved having the opportunity to talk to you, Mo. Thank you.